Good afternoon, brethren. I am extremely, extremely happy to be here today. And to be honest with you, every day <laughs> that God has granted me the privilege of being alive, and I think that goes for all of us, we are to be extremely extremely grateful. Um, I'm going to ask the technical person to help me plug this in. You know, since I have been called by God into his church, more and more, the longer time permits, I come to see how privileged we are as a people to be given this honor of being in his church. It must not be taken lightly. And looking on, anyone seeing us may be judging by how we look and by where we meet. But I want to reinforce and to encourage you to understand that all of that is by design. We do not have the most elaborate of buildings or the brightest people by the world's standards to be here. But I think that is part of what God is doing. He really wants to see if we can appreciate what we have. And he really wants to see whether the world that is looking on can discern who we are and how significant we are on the globe. According to the World Encyclopedia of Religion, there are approximately 45,000 Christian denominations on the earth. Denominations on the earth. And each believe within themselves that what they're doing is the will of God. I have no doubt that people are utmostly sincere, that they are fully committed, that they make the necessary sacrifices to do what they do unto God based on their understanding of the scriptures. And we are a body that can explain all of that. We can take you the scriptures and show you why that is. We can show you that God has not abandoned nor overlooked the vast majority of people 
who are in their own way, whether it is in Christianity or it is in Buddhism or Hinduism and all the various religions out there, we in this little body have an understanding that baffles the world to the extent that they can't, they can't believe it. They can't believe it. And they feel that a little people so insignificant is not qualified to be the leaders and interpreters of scripture to them. And I'm saying all of that because the topic of the sermon I wish to deliver today is a controversial one. I remember some time ago in one of our outreach and campaigns when I touched on this topic A group of people stood up and went out. They can't believe that this is so. And I'm speaking today aware that there are a number of people who are listening in on the internet. And I want to say to you, pay a little attention. Give me a chance. to show you what I understand from the scriptures. I may be wrong, but you can't know if I'm wrong unless you listen in and examine what I have to say. And if I'm wrong, at least you know that you have something much bigger, much greater, much more wonderful than what I have to say. But if I'm right, you have an awesome responsibility on your shoulder to contend with the points that are being made, to compare them with scripture, to evaluate them. Otherwise, you'll be held guilty. You'll be held guilty of hearing the message and not examining it against the Bible. Now, that is if you believe in Christianity and if you believe that there is a God and all that. But there's a way in which our conscience can condemn us when we are given an opportunity to hear a message from the scriptures that challenge your thinking. So the topic of this sermon is titled, Is There Only One True Church? The topic alone will cause people to say, what, you think you're the one true church? Where you come from thinking that you're the one true church? I'm not thinking that, that's not what I'm thinking. What I'm thinking is what the Bible says. And if you want to judge what I have to say, go to the scriptures. Let us do it that way. Because I am interested in knowing what is true. And any day, you can show me in the scriptures where I am contradicting the scriptures. Where the scriptures clearly 
explains that what I'm saying here is wrong and not of God. I will thank you. I will thank you for opening my eyes using the scripture. So, I want you to pay some attention. I want you to be, listen critically, intensely. And I want questions. Don't know if the time will allow for, you know, I know we have to, to get out at a particular time. But then the questions can be asked at any time. No one can deny that when Jesus promised to build his church, that he, his words, the way in which he spoke, was very clear that he was speaking of a singular entity. He said in Matthew 16 and verse 18, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. On this rock, I will build my churches. Church, singular. Unless you did not understand the hell of, the, 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 the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Singular. You can't read this and say that, well, every church is God's church. So, Jesus was speaking about a singular church, and everyone who wants to become part of that church must follow in the teachings that he gave. And as a reinforcement, just hours before his death, his prayer was that all believers would be one. He always intended for it to be one church. So he would say, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and you must all speak the same things. You can't be speaking all over the place. There must be unity of mind and thought around these teachings. But you know, there are difficult texts in the Bible, a number of them that seem to contradict the idea that there is only one true church. And these are the texts that confuse millions of people to think that, well, no, I mean, look, you can choose and go to whichever. But that's not the teaching of the Bible. For example, here's one of the controversial texts. You find it in John 10 and verse 16. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold, of sheep pen. I have other sheep. 
He's speaking about another. They are not of this sheep pen. So it's interpreted it's not of this church. I have other churches. Because if Jesus has sheep which are not of this sheep pen, how can we claim that there is only one true church? Is Jesus here saying that there are spirits filled people that he has which are not of the body we call the church? Are the Catholics and the Baptists and the Methodists and the Pentecostals and the Evangelicals and all of the Sunday keeping churches? Are they all people with God's spirit? Now this, this, is, why, this is why people don't like it. Because it tends to mean that boy you're being excluded. But you know what? Bear it for a minute. Because this sermon is for you. To at least hear it and to respond. To show where it is wrong. Or hear it and digest it and meditate on it. To transform your life. So that scripture really is disruptive. It calls for thinking. It calls for explanation. Here's another one. It's found in Mark chapter 9 and verse 38 to 40. You can turn there. It reads like this. Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop. Because he was not one of us. Jesus replied, do not stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the same moment say something bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. You are seeing scriptures which would suggest that God has other churches, other people that are not a part of his body, the body that he calls the church, or that are part of another body which is his, which is another church. So has Jesus empowered other people who are not in the body, in, this, in, the, in the church that he built? Does he have various ministers performing miracles like those on our television screens? Are they ministers of Jesus Christ? I just want to get into these two texts for you today and explain them to show you how important it is to understand the unity of scripture and how we cannot be diverted simply because somebody shows a text. Because all texts are God's texts. And all texts must be accounted for. Therefore, all texts must be explained using the principle of Scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. 
So how do we answer these seemingly contradictory texts? What was Jesus saying in John 10? Was he saying he has sheep in churches outside the church of God? Churches that do not keep his Sabbaths, his feast days, his laws? Is he saying that? Let's look at the text again. We're going to explain it. What Jesus said here is, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. What you will see in this very text as we go through it is that Jesus is referring to those he has ordained to be called to eternal life but are not yet called. In the church. Therefore, they are not yet in this fold. They are not baptized people. They don't have God's Holy Spirit. But they are people which from the foundation of the earth have been predestined and earmarked and will be called in due course. You're going to see that coming out of the text when you read it properly. How do we know that this is what the text means? Because in the next sentence, Jesus says, Them also I must bring. Them also I must bring. God's plan is to bring them. They are not yet in the church. They are presently outside the church. Likely in other congregations. Sitting in the pews of churches all over. But they have been predestined. And will be called. So, look at the text with me. The next thing Jesus says is, and they will hear my voice. They have not yet heard his voice. They have not yet heard the gospel. They will, in the future, hear my voice. They have never heard it. They have not heard it. But they will hear it. That's a future development. They will hear and they will believe when God is ready to call them. And what does he say after that? They will hear my voice and there will be one flock. When they come in, it's still one church. They come in and join the one flock. There will be one flock and one shepherd. Are you following me? Are you seeing it in your Bible? Are you reading your Bible? It is clearly written, unmistakably. It is at that time they will be included. So you will have the one church, the one flock. The one shepherd. That is what God is about. There's no confusion with God. There's no way, way we can escape with our little brains trying to think through with our own effort. That is why it is by God's spirit that he wrote the word and it's by his spirit that he interprets it. So those who are ordained 
from the foundation of the earth to eternal life are sheep of God. He could refer to them as sheep. But they are not yet in the fold. This is the principle. There's a, there is a principle, the same principle used when John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who was slain from the foundation of the earth. Jesus was referred to as Lamb, although he was not yet, had not yet come. But he is the Lamb of God from the foundation of the earth. When you are called, you are God's chosen from the foundation of the earth. But your calling will be manifested in due course. And that is why you have to have regard for those who are in other churches. You have to look at them and understand how God calls. On many occasions, people come through a journey. And each step of the journey is important. Because in many cases, it's important for them to hear false doctrine before they can recognize and appreciate true doctrine. And therefore, when they are in that phase, don't, don't trouble it. All you do, when they hear, when they hear the message, when God is ready for them, they will move. They will move. So, there are no true churches or true Christians in churches outside God's church. But there are persons ordained to be called sitting in pews outside the church of God. And I tell you, when they're called, they'll put many of us to shame. They say, you mean that you knew this? You knew this all along? Are you going on with that? It's better that we come to appreciate these things in a manner that shows how powerful the Word of God is, how much it is written not just for people to understand in the whims and fancy of their minds and their thinking, but to be understood by using scripture to explain scripture. What about the text in Mark 9, 38 to 40? Teacher, said John, we saw a man driving out demons in your name. And we told him to stop because he was not one of us. You think Jesus would turn and say, boy, thank you very much. You're doing your work. Really appreciate it. No. Jesus said, do not stop him. No one who does a miracle in my name can in the, same, in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Many go away with the idea that Jesus was saying that. That man is one of my disciples. That's not what he was saying. That's not the answer he gave. Read the text carefully. What is the text saying? Jesus is not saying the man was one of his disciples. Instead, Jesus was laying down a principle to guide his disciples to understand who the man was. They were coming to a conclusion that they are not one of us on their own. But how do you come to that conclusion? No, don't stop him. Do your homework. That's what Jesus is saying.
So what is the principle? Jesus is saying that they should follow. The principle is, do not stop him, test him. You can't just go there and stop the man. You don't know, you're not God. Test him. In other words, you can't know by yourself whether he's one of us. You will have to know by the scriptures. So the thing to do is to test to see if he is one of us. So how do you test him? How do you test to see him? Who do not believe him, in him, and by those who believe in him? Miracles is not exclusive to the church of God. Miracles, in fact, will be the highlight, the hallmark of lawlessness in the end times. So, that's what the Bereans did. The Bereans, they heard Paul, they heard what he's saying, they took their notes, and then they searched the scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. For whoever is not against me is with me. So if the man's beliefs was aligned with scripture, he's one of us. But if his utterances and beliefs contradict scripture, he's not one of us. But you must do your homework. That is how we can look at some of the miracle working televangelists and know that they are not of God because their teaching do not align with scripture. And we can point out to you and show you where they're totally off. The laws of God, as far as they are concerned, are abolished. We are under grace. We don't need any law. We can test and say, ah, see? You see those things that they're doing? Not of God. Not of God. Quite easily we can do that. So we must listen to what they preach and teach, what they believe, whether they preach the gospel or another gospel, because it's not just one gospel. There's another gospel, which is no real gospel at all, but it is presented as a gospel, as the gospel. But Paul swears by it. He says, if any other man comes to you and preach a gospel other than the one that I preach to you, let him be accursed. I go further. If even an angel from heaven comes and preach another gospel to you, let him be accursed, even an angel. That's how extreme Paul went to make the point that there are gospels out there, but it is another gospel. It is not the gospel which God wants us to preach. Because remember, Jesus could not be saying that the man is his disciple or is not. Maybe as God, he knew for sure. But he wanted to teach disciples how to be diligent and how to go about it. Because he is the one who said to them in Matthew 7, 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then... I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So we have to have it together. 
We can't just take it for granted and just think that, well, you know, see, they're, 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 you're going to tell me that that man is not a man of God. Look at what he's doing. I'm going to carry my mother down there. So you will see, brethren, the, the level of deception that lies out there. But make your notes. Make your notes. Because these are scriptures that we ought to know. Because the purpose of the church is to equip the saints for works of service unto God. You see, there are many similarities between churches that call themselves Christian. They all believe that there is a savior, Jesus Christ. Whatever variations they may have, what they believe, they believe that he's the son of God. Some may say he's a prophet, but they believe he's a super prophet. They believe that he died and was resurrected and ascended into heaven. That, that's a common ground. All of us believe that. All of us believe that. They believe he's coming again. Although some say to take it to heaven. But some, some do believe it's to come on the earth. Some do. Yes, they do. So you can see there's a common ground there. Another thing that, that is common among churches is that they believe that there is a set of beliefs that you must agree to call yourself a Christian. They're all common grounds. So in many ways we look like them. Or they look like us. So it's not everything that they believe is wrong. Many of what they believe is absolutely right. But we must understand what we are dealing with. They have a set of beliefs, and they practice their beliefs according to how they believe it is to be practiced. But the real issue is to determine what that set of beliefs must be. That is important. The core beliefs of the church must be such that they do not violate scripture. They do not violate the teachings of Christ. The beliefs must also be such that that set of beliefs will take you into the kingdom by you following them. Very important. So you can have a set of beliefs, but it is deficient. You can have a set of beliefs where your beliefs is better than another set a group, another denomination or so. So you feel that you are advanced and so on. But at the bottom of the line, is there anything that you are doing or not doing that can prevent you from entering the kingdom of God? That's what you must focus on. What is it that I am believing that is locking me out of the kingdom of God? Or what is it that I do not believe that is locking me 
out of the kingdom of God. And that is where we approach these churches. We say to them, you know, there are a lot of things that you do and I do that are common. We agree, we agree, we agree. We can tick off, tick off, tick off, and so on. But we are saying that there are some essentials. There are mandatory things that if you do not believe them, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. We are making that bold statement. We are saying you are locked out because you fail to believe. So you fail to meet the requirement for entering the kingdom of God. The question is this. Here's a question that I'd like for our listeners online to think about. Because we want to pre present some answers to them. So here is the first question. Are people who refuse to keep the Sabbath and the feast days of God living in sin? Are they living in sin? Are they transgressors? Second, does the Bible reveal that they cannot enter the kingdom of God by failing to observe his Sabbath and holy days. We are throwing all those challenges. You have your Bible. Come back and, and say to me, look, God, God is not fussy. God is okay. God only check the sincerity of our hearts towards him. God is just inclined to know that you have the right attitude and the right spirit. The, 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 the literal things are not what God is concerned about. Because if the answer to the questions that I've just asked is yes, If it is that by not observing the Sabbath and the feast days of God, the holy days of God, maybe you can come back to me and say, look here, all right? I agree. But here are some other things that you should be observing. And you're not. I want to hear them. I want to hear them. Show me in the Bible the way I am showing you these things in the Bible. That they are a requirement. That if you don't do them, you're both sinning and you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do that. Let's be big about this. Let's not just simply be trying to carve out your own little space and so on. Let's be open that where we are wrong, we are willing also to be corrected. But bring it to us from scripture, not from human tradition. So if the answer is yes, then it means what it means. If it means that you are living in sin, and if it means you cannot enter the kingdom of God by ignoring them, It means that all the churches, brethren, all the churches, the Sunday-keeping churches and whatever other churches, that do not keep the Sabbath and the feast days, all of them are locked out. All of them are living in sin. The point is, 
We need to prove that that is so. We need to prove that Sabbath is a requirement for entering the kingdom of God. And that breaking Sabbath is sin. You are living in sin. We have to prove that to them. And that is coming up in a minute. But I want it to be understood. We're not being unreasonable. We're simply presenting a case. And we want to have a balanced approach. We're all humans. We all make errors. We're all born in sin. So don't count me. Count the scriptures. That's what we must do. So, we are saying that non Sabbath keepers and non feast keepers are living in sin, they are transgressors. God says the wage of sin is death. We want anyone listening to our voice here to take this seriously and to examine it and to examine what we are saying to see where we get our information from. So, can it be proven from the scriptures that keeping the Sabbath and feast days is a requirement for entering the kingdom of God? Is it absolutely necessary? I'm reinforcing the question. Is it absolutely necessary for people calling themselves Christians to keep the Sabbath and feast days? Will a person who does not keep the Sabbath and feast days enter the kingdom of God? I'm going to take you to the New Testament because people expect me to go to the Old Testament. I'm not going there. At least not as a whole. I want to take the New Testament because many say they are New Testament Christians. And if you are a New Testament Christian, you should have an interest in looking at the New Testament and what it says. So let us go to Hebrews 4, which many are aware of, and see God's requirement for keeping his Sabbath. Hebrews 4, take note of this. Hebrews 4 introduces the Sabbath in the context of a warning. against falling away. Right away you see that that is a salvific thing. It is introduced, the Sabbath is introduced in the context of a warning against falling away. What does verse 1 say of Hebrews 4? Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, the promise of entering God's rest the eternal rest, the entry into the kingdom or the entry into the promised land as it was known. Since that promise still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Okay. Okay. So there's a warning. What is this idea about falling short of it? Look at verse 9. And I'm going to come back and deal with the other verses in between. But look at verse 9. There remains a Sabbath rest the Greek for that term, the Sabbath is talking of here, Sabbatismus meaning liberal, literal Sabbath keeping. It says, there remains a Sabbath rest 
for the people of God. Huh, wait, come on. There remains, what, 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 what is that saying? What are you learning from that? Sometimes we read over these texts, but we're not digging in. Let's dig in. Let's enjoy the text. Because if he says it remains, if something remains, it means it was there before. You can't say it remains. If it is new, you say that, well, a Sabbath has been given. But it remains. And remains for who? For the people of God. So, if there is a Sabbath that remains, where was it before? Who was observing it? Why you talk about remains? That means you have not moved it. Well, it was kept by the patriarchs. It was kept by the prophets. It was kept by the apostles. So to say it remains is to say it was not abolished. Plain language. We don't have to go around the bush. Plain language. And if it remains for the people of God, it means that it was a people of God who used to keep it, and therefore it now remains for the people of God today. That's very important fine tuning of the text. It's important for us to get our teeth into it and to begin to enjoy and to savor it. Just that alone, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God right away. It throws out all the arguments because people say, oh, it was nailed to the cross and you don't need it anymore, you have grace. But it remains, and remains for the people of God. Then look at Hebrews 4.10. Hebrews 4.10. Anyone who enters God's rest, remember we started off, you must make every effort to enter God's rest. Well, anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work just as God did from his. The example of the Sabbath keeping is God. And we are asked to take our cue or teaching from God. So God himself rests from his own work and we are asked to be imitators of God. To be like God. To do what God did. Do you believe that you should do what God did? Is that a good example to follow? The person who comes to God, it is saying, must rest from his work in the manner God rested from his work. So the question is, how did God rest from his work? Because, I mean, you can say, do it like God, but say, well, well how did God? You, you, I, I'd like to imitate God, but, but how did he do it? I'm going to keep you in the New Testament for a while. I'm going to keep you in the New Testament for God. Because the New Testament, frankly, to be convinced that the Sabbath is to be observed, you don't really need the Old Testament, per se. The New Testament takes care of it. All the New Testament um, Christians, New Testament believers, who believe that Old Testament, I'm carrying it to the New Testament. So how did God rest from his work? Look at verse 4 of Hebrews 4. Somebody read it for me. 
Because you may think I have another Bible here. A different Bible from what you have. What does verse 4 of Hebrews 4 say? How did God rest from his work? Because that's what you must imitate. You must imitate God. You must do it the way God does it. How did God rest from his work? You want to know, I think Elder Hendricks is coming up. He had his Bible, his, his, the, the scriptures right in front of him. And he's going to read it for us. Elder, please just read it for us, please. Yes, here is Elder. Read for me, because you may think that I'm reading for some other Bible. Hebrews 4 and verse 4. For he has spoken somewhere about the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Okay. Thank you, brother. It's in the New Testament. Don't come and tell me about Moses and Old Testament and law and Sinai and covenant. Right there in the New Testament, you are told to rest from your work just as God rested from his work and then it is answered for you right there in the New Testament in verse 4 of Hebrews, God rested from his work on the seventh day. Hallelujah! Amen! You are a fortunate set of people to be called into the church. So am I. Very fortunate to be called into the church. It's all there for you. So if all you have is a little New Testament in your back pocket, work with it. We can work with it. So, what Hebrews 4.10, which we read earlier, is saying, is that anyone who enters God's rest must rest from his work on the seventh day, just as God rested from his work on the seventh day. It's all right. You can be stubborn. You can be listening to it and saying, I never hear those sort of things talking about before. That is why I'm quoting Bible. And for your convenience, I'm quoting New Testament since many people say Old Testament is old. But it doesn't end there, brethren. It doesn't end there. Listen to this. Listen to this warning. In the New Testament, book of Hebrews, to those who fail to keep the Sabbath. Hebrews 4, look in verse 11. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. Who is it there? Who is there? That's Israel. Israel, example of disobedience. So we need to understand what was Israel's example of disobedience that caused them to fall, that we are being warned against. Do not allow it to happen to us. What is it? Look in verse 3 of the same Hebrews 4. Look in, the same, in verse 3 of the same Hebrews 4. God saying, so I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Okay. God declared an oath in his anger that they will never enter his rest. When was that? Why was that? Where was that? Where did God angrily declare an oath against Israel. Against them entering his rest. And on what occasion did he declare that? Because this is a damning oath. It's a condemning oath. So let's find it. Go to Ezekiel. Chapter 20. We're doing investigative study here. 
we are testing a case and we are like detectives trying to see where we can find the truth. And here we are seeing that God himself explains this example of Israel's disobedience, which he is instructing us not to follow. Israel carried out disobedience that prevented them from entering the land, prevented them from entering the kingdom. And we want to know what that disobedience was because we are warned against it. Read verse 13 of Ezekiel 20. It says, Yet the people of Israel rebelled against me, God speaking, rebelled against me in the desert. So they were in the desert. That's when. That's where. They did not follow my decrees but rejected my laws. And they utterly desecrated my Sabbaths. Verse 15. Also, with uplifted hands, I swore to them, this is where he swore with the oath now. We are finding it. We are finding the evidence. I swore to them with uplifted hands. in the desert, that I would not bring them into the land I had given to them. Verse 16, because, here's the reason, because they rejected my laws and did not follow my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths. All of this we are reading because of teachings of God from the New Testament. Because many people, every time you talk about Sabbath and going to Old Testament and so on, they say, yes, but Moses, yes, but covenant, yes, but Sinai. No. You have no excuse. You have absolutely no excuse. If you have respect for the scriptures, if you have regard for the word of God, if you honor truth, you will. Your heart, your mind, your conscience is going to bother you. You're not going to be very happy if the Lord is calling you. If God is calling you, and this is coming forth to you, and you resist through your conscience, really, you're in trouble. Israel did not enter the land because they desecrated God's Sabbath, and you and I are warned not to make the same mistake. So, is it true that by refusing to obey God's Sabbath, one, you are living in sin, and two, you will not enter the kingdom of God? Very clear in front of us. This is a plain warning in the New Testament. And he who hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Because most churches teach that the Sabbaths and festivals of God were nailed to the cross. That they were somehow annulled by the death of Christ. But the unmistakable record of the Bible condemns that lie. And if you really love God and you're really seeking to serve him, this should have some meaning for you. If not, 
Ignore it. Ignore it. But the blood is off of my shoulders. So what about the feast days? And I know we did some study on feast days this morning. And we spoke about the origin in Genesis 14. I'd like to share one of these days on that subject. But it's a very stimulating exercise, the Bible study. And thanks to Brother Jeremy and Brother Jonah for taking us through this morning. But it is a very exciting time to be sharing the news about God's festivals, particularly as we approach the holy days and they are close to us. But there are many references in the New Testament, many references in the book of Acts, in Paul's epistles, They speak about, in the Gospels, they speak about the observance of God's feast days. And what puzzles me is this. You know, when I came to the church, I didn't know anything about it. Feast days and so on. Believe you me, I've had debates and arguments with Jehovah Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists and so on. And with all the respect to the Seventh-day Adventist church, I went to a Seventh-day Adventist college and all that. But for all the years I was there, they did not convince me to observe the Sabbath because the texts that I would raise, they, it, it was not answered. was not answered. And... One of the, the key things nowadays when I'm talking to people about Sabbath, one of the things I do, I said, look, let me not talk to you about Sabbath. Let me talk to you about the first day of the week. Because that's what you observe. And every time we come, we come, you're talking about Sabbath. No, no, I'm a Sabbath keeper. But what I want to talk about is the first day of the week in Scripture. The significance of the first day of the week in scripture. Let's talk about that. That's how I can convince you about Sabbath. Because if you understand what the first day of the week is in scripture, you'll abandon your weekly Sunday worship. Because you'll come to find out that what the first day of the week in scripture is, is one of the, 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 the observances that God gave also to Moses to tell the Israelites. And you have taken it and turned it around. It happens once per year. And you take it and doing it every week. You're doing it every week. You don't understand it. So we will, we will, we have our, you know, God has prepared us to deal with these things. But why don't churches teach and observe these feasts today. And I'm asking this question to that gentleman and that lady who might be listening at this point and are faithful observers in their church on Sunday. I congratulate you. You have a mind for God. But I want to show you a little bit more about what God wants of you. And that there is much to learn. But I want to show you where, just like the Sabbath, if you do not keep the feast days, you are condemned, you will be condemned. 
you will be condemned. It is a requirement that we keep the feast days. I'll share with you some other time. And when I say I, we, the church here, will share with you some other time. Why God is so merciful not to condemn those in an everlasting fire who are in ignorance. Because God holds himself responsible for opening your mind to truth. And he has that plan. One of these days we'll show it to you. So when we talk like this, we are speaking against a background with a lot that we can share with you to show you how God thinks, how God works, and what God expects of you. But why not teach what is in the Bible? Because it is not so difficult. Let's go to Zechariah 14, because I don't want to be long, or much longer, in this. But I want us to go there, because we are talking about are you sinning if you do not keep the Sabbath and feast days? Can you enter the kingdom of God if you do not keep the Sabbath and the feast days? That's the challenge we are throwing out. And we invite anyone, everyone who wishes to come in and speak with us about it. To do so, we are open. We want to hear you. We want you to say, from what you said, here is where you are wrong. Do that. We're willing to listen to you. But look at this now. We're just going to use the Feast of Tabernacles as the example. All of you are aware. But this is not just for us. The church is supposed to preach and teach that the world might hear. And those that God is calling may be saved. Verse 1 of Zechariah 14. It says, A day of the Lord is coming when your plunder will be divided among you. A day of the Lord is speaking about the day that is not yet come. It's speaking about the return of Jesus Christ. That's the day of the Lord which is spoken about in all, most, most of the, the Old Testament pointing to it. And then we see that that day of the Lord was given as a vision to John, where he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He, he, he was brought forth to see the things that would happen in the day of the Lord. A day of the Lord is coming. Verse 3, then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fought in the day of battle. God is coming to the earth to fight a war against those who have been tearing it down, headed by Satan, the devil. Verse 4, on that day, his feet should stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half moving to the south. Jesus is coming back to the earth in the fashion he departed. He departed from the Mount of Olives. And when he returned, he's returning to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Landing there, the whole world it's going to be in turmoil. It's going to be shaken. It's going to be like you've never seen it before. This is about the return of Jesus. You are a Christian that says you're looking forward to the return of Jesus, isn't it? Yes, you said that. You said that you're waiting for the Lord. You're saying, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. Don't just say it. Yes, you do. And you're hoping for the coming of the Messiah. Yes. So... Look at what this has to say to you. It 
It says in verse 6, On that day there will be no light, no cold, no frost. Sounds familiar? You get that same picture from the book of Revelation. It will be one day. This is the day of the Lord. There's no night. One day, the day of the Lord has come. It will be a unique day. Without daytime or without nighttime. A day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. That's the day of the Lord that is coming. What is going to happen? Why are we being told about it? What does it have to do with God's Sabbath and festivals? Verse 9. The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name one. Which means that God will bring to end man-made rule. And God's rulership will now govern the earth. Now listen to this. Are you ready for this? You better listen to this. Because this is what you should have been taught all along. That is not being taught. But this is the day of the Lord that is being spoken of. And look at what is going to happen. And you tell me why it is that people refuse to keep God's festivals. This one is going to be talking about the Feast of Tabernacles. Then the survivors from all the nations that have attacked Jerusalem will go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord Almighty, and to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. To celebrate what? To celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Why? Because God is now here. Because Jesus is now King over the whole earth. Because this is what should be happening all along. But Satan is the God of this world. And he continues to give you his observances. His Christmas. His Easter. His Good Friday. And all the rest of them as Wednesday and all the 40 day Lent and all that kind of thing. Which is coming up. All of that. You will never see that being observed. When the day of the Lord comes. No. It is brought to an end. Because you should not be observing it. See the feast here that you should be observing. It's called the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 17. If any of the peoples of the earth. Do not go up to Jerusalem. To worship the King. The Lord Almighty. They will have no rain. Punishment. You talk about drought? If you do not keep the Feast of Tabernacles, you're in trouble. You will be in trouble. Your life will be threatened. You need rain. You need it to get your water. You need it for all the things that water does. But God says you'll have no rain. Verse 18. If the Egyptian people, no, the Israelites, no, the Egyptian people, do not go up and take part, they will have no rain. Because you say, it's Moses' feast and it's for Israel. Those things is for Israel. If the Egyptian people do not go up, they will have no rain. It goes on. The Lord will bring on them the plague he inflicted, inflicted on the nations that do not go up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Plagues, plagues like happened in Egypt. It's going to be up on the earth. Why? Why is it happening? You're not keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. I want to tell you, you know, why you're having so much trouble in the world today. And why all of these chaos that is taking place. It is happening because we are not following God's way. It is man's way that we are following. God is not up to that. It goes on. And says in verse, in verse 19, this will be the punishment of Egypt and 
the punishment of all the nations. Which nation does that exclude? Which nation is excluded from all the nations? This will be the punishment of Egypt and all the nations that do not go up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The question is, do you believe this? Do you believe this? That's, a, that's an important thing, you know. I could, we could read and study and talk as much. Do you believe this? I pray that God will advance his words into the ears and the hearts of the people who will hear these words. And to say, when COVID come, you're busy trying to find ways and means. When hurricane come, you're busy to find ways and means to get things settled. There is a time coming that no COVID, no hurricane, no war can be compared. It's going to be harsh punishment. And those who refuse to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, why not keep it today? Since it is the punishment. It will bring punishment when you don't do it in the future. Oh, you say you'll wait? You'll wait. You have time to wait. You know what that means? When you say you'll wait, it means that you understand. And he who knows much, much is required of them. He that knows my Father's will and do it not will be flogged with many stripes. So you have heard it. Well, you say, you'll wait. That is an affront to the creator of the heavens and the earth. But some church, church leaders will say, the reason God overlooks those who break the Feast of Tabernacles today is because we are under grace. So are you saying that grace is a privilege, my brother, for transgressing the law of God? Don't you know that that question has been answered? Answered in Romans 6, 1 to 2, by the Apostle Paul? The fact is, grace does not permit us to break the laws of God. And you are saying, because you have grace, it's okay to go ahead and break the law of God. Here's what Paul says. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. So your question has been answered, Mr. Preacher. What we want is to make it clear. It's clear to us here in the church of God. We look in the scriptures and we saw that Jesus kept the Sabbath and kept the feasts. We look in the scriptures and we see that the prophets of God of old, they observe the Sabbaths and the feast. We see the apostles observing the Sabbaths and the feasts. We see the early church observing the Sabbaths and the feasts. We see the saints of the end time when Jesus returns, that they will have to observe the Sabbaths and feasts. We see that all nations will have to come before God and observe it, otherwise they will be punished. How about you? How about you, my brother? How about you, my sister? Is your heart so hardened that you cannot budge to God's calling? May God have his way. Amen.